Good afternoon. Um, it's great to be here. It's my first time in Denver. Never been here before. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the 12 principles of collaboration, and I'll start, you know, I'll let you know why 12 principles in just a second. But there we go. So really briefly, for anybody that's interested in getting more resources, more information about this stuff, I created a special landing page for the NewsGator conference. So if you go to chessmediagroup.com slash NewsGator2013, you'll, first of all, you'll be able to see this PowerPoint presentation up there now in case you want to follow along. And second, you'll have the opportunity to download a bunch of case studies, resources, and stuff like that if you're interested. And we're going to be launching a community in the next month or so. So you'll also have the opportunity to let us know if you're interested in joining that community. And the community is going to be for practitioners, for decision makers, for executives at companies all over the world to come together, share ideas, best practices, provide feedback, and help each other out. So a little bit about me. Um, as you can probably tell from this picture, I do love to travel. Um, I run a company called Chess Media Group, and I like to think I have one of the coolest jobs in the world. I get to work with organizations on the future of work and collaboration initiatives. So we really get to help organizations understand how the changes in behavior and technology are impacting the way that organizations work. For those of you that are uh, interested, I blog at socialbusinessadvisor.com, and I talk a lot about this stuff on Twitter as well, so you can send me a message at Jacob M. Happy to answer any questions if you have them. Now, one of the things people always ask is, uh, why Chess Media Group? What, is, what does collaboration have to do with chess? And I'll answer that in, in just a second. Um, but chess has kind of like a personal significance for me because my grandmother taught me how to play chess when I was very young. And chess has been pretty instrumental in everything that I've done. You know, it helps you look at the big picture of things. You start to look at patterns. And so, you know, part of why the company was named Chess Media Group is not only because I love chess, but you know, my grandmother taught me a lot, so that, that's why the company was named Chess Media Group. So briefly about the book, and first of all, I want to say thanks to NewsGator because they're going to be giving everyone a copy of the book, so thank you very much to NewsGator for that. Appreciate it. Uh, I think the NewsGator team is going to be following up with everyone after the conference, and some books are here, but those that aren't, uh, they'll either be sent to you via a physical or a digital copy. I have a couple here that I'm going to give out, so I'm going to ask questions, and if you guys answer the question or come close to getting the right answer, I'll give you a copy of the book. So what makes this book unique? It's the first comprehensive strategy guide on enterprise collaboration. It looks at everything from how to evaluate and pick vendors, to adoption strategies, to how to structure your team, to measures of success, um, and there's even a maturity model in there that you can look at to help you figure out where your organization is in all of this. So a little bit about chess. Um, does anybody here play chess, by the way? OK, wow. Does anybody know who the number one chess player in the world is? Who? What? <laughs> Not Watson. Not Jacob. I wish I was the number one judge. No, no. No, no, no. He's, uh, he's second or third. His name is Magnus Carlsen from Norway. He's a young kid. Um, let me ask you another question. Within the first four moves of a chess game, meaning I make four moves and you make four moves, how many possible moves do you think there are? I'll give you a book if you get it right within 10 million. Within just four moves, how many possible combinations are there? Anybody want to take a guess? Million? Way off. Anyone else want to take a guess? More. Way more. Over 300 billion. Over 300 billion possible moves within the first four moves of a chess game. In fact, there are more possible chess moves than there are atoms in the entire universe, and more possible moves in a game of chess than there are seconds that have elapsed since the Big Bang. You can look these things up if you don't believe me. I know it sounds staggering. But it's really fascinating when you think about that because this is all just on an 8x8 square, right? 8x8 board. We only have 64 squares and so many combinations. So if we have so many possible combinations, what's the point of becoming a chess master? How do you even become a chess master? I mean, it's an infinite game, right? Why waste your time? Any good chess master or grandmaster will tell you that the key to winning a game of chess is not just you know, knowing everything that's possible, but to look at patterns and to look at situations and to identify those patterns and know when you're in that certain situation. That's kind of the principle behind this presentation on the 12 principles of collaboration. These are the 12 common patterns 
or situations that I see and that Chess Media Group sees come up time and time again. Now, there are a lot of variables that can impact your collaboration initiatives, right? I mean, it could come from your HR department, you can be in a regulated company, you can have a lot of budget, a little bit of budget, big team, small team. You have virtually an infinite set of, uh, of combinations you can be dealing with. But there are some very, very common patterns when we look at chess. So what's really fascinating, not just about social media um, and the internet, is it's not just shattering the way we think about work, it's changing the way we think about everything, right? Not just work. It's changing the way we think about learning, the way we think about education, the way we think about transportation, right? We have these collaborative models where you can rent cars, you can rent textbooks, you can rent clothing, you can, you can do anything. So today's focus is gonna be on the workplace, but social media and all these tools and, and different things that we're talking about are changing everything, right? Absolutely everything. Now, I can't make this up, so I don't know if you guys can, um, can see this in the back. I did not make this up. These are actual dictionary synonyms for what these things mean, right? And for some of you that can't read it in the back, synonym for work, drudgery, struggle, daily grind. Uh, my favorite one, synonyms for the manager, slave driver, <laughs> zookeeper. And for the employee, synonym, cog, servant, slave. Right? How sad is that? That these are the synonyms that, that you know, are associated with these things that we deal with on a daily basis. Now, I put these up here because this just goes to show what we're working against. Right? Most of the organizations that are around have been around for a long time. They've been created and built from the ground up like this. Right? These are the words that have been used to describe many of our companies. And now it's all being shattered and it's all changing. But we have a long way to go and it's tough because this is what we're going against. Right? We have to challenge the notion that an employee is not a slave, that he's not a cog that a manager is not a slave driver, and that work isn't the daily grind, and it's not drudgery, right? These are all things that we're trying to kind of go against. Now, this is my brother. I don't know if, he, he actually probably doesn't know that I use him in these presentations. Um, and he's not on Twitter, <laughs> which is good. But this is the future workforce, right? This is what we're dealing with. How many of you guys remember what it was like to do business before the internet? Right? I don't. I have no clue, no concept of what it was like to do business before the internet. Everything I've done, the company that I've built, the clients that we work with, everything has been done through social and collaborative tools. I have no clue what it's like. So maybe afterwards, we can get together and you guys can you know, tell me what it was like because I, I, I have no concept of what that was like. Now that's me, this is my brother who's younger than me. So imagine what it's gonna be like for him. Now what's really cool about this picture, I don't know if anybody's into uh, videography or film or anything like that, he's holding probably eh, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 worth of video equipment that he paid for by himself. And what's interesting is when you look at and think about, well how did this kid, who's 19, 20 years old, make money to pay for all this stuff? Yeah, how did he learn about film and how did he learn about videography? Anybody want to take a guess on how he was able to build a business for himself being a videographer and a photographer? For free? Yes. YouTube videos, discussion forums, book for you, yes. Oh, you're welcome. So he learned how to do all these things for free, right? When I went to UC Santa Cruz, I had friends that were majoring in film that were spending, I don't know, forty to sixty, eighty thousand dollars to get an education in film. He learned videography and film through YouTube videos, discussion forums, through Facebook through connecting with people, he learned how to do all of this by himself from scratch for free, right? That just goes to show how things are changing. Now imagine somebody like this entering your workforce, right? Your workforce, you have a static intranet, you know, get 100, 150 emails a day, and you have somebody like Josh who enters your company, right? Somebody that learned how to do all these things by himself for free. Somebody that's used to sharing, to getting insights, to, to providing ideas. And you have somebody like this that enters the workforce. Now imagine it's his first day, and you say, okay, Josh, nice to meet you. And he says, okay, how do I start connecting with people and sharing and learning? No, sorry, Josh, you can't do that here, right? You will get 100 emails. Uh, you can't share your ideas, you can't share your feedback. This is what a CRM system looks like. 
He has no clue what a CRM system looks like. You show him, uh, you know, one of these legacy, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm trying hard not to mention any vendors. You show him a legacy CRM system and he will freak out, right? This is the future workforce, right? This is what is entering the workforce now. So this is the big gap that we're seeing between the consumer web and the enterprise, right? On the consumer web, we're seeing new tools, new, new technologies, we're seeing transparency, ease of use, intuitiveness, connecting, engaging, building relationships. And what do we see on the enterprise, or in most enterprises? We're trapped in email, we're using legacy systems, we have this hierarchy approach, right? We're not adapting, we're scared. There's a fear-based culture oftentimes for a lot of managers. Don't do, you know, do this or you get punished. Right? So we're seeing these huge gaps between the consumer web and the enterprise. And now the enterprises are starting to freak out. They're starting to figure out, you know, how can we adapt to what's happening on the consumer side? So here's an interesting um, thing that happened a couple of years ago. Now, if I were to ask you 10 years ago, let's say we're to go take 10 giant red balloons and put them all over the United States, and you had to go find them. You group yourselves in teams and you had to find 10 giant red balloons in random locations across the United States. 10 years ago, do you think that would have been possible at all? Probably not, right? What are you gonna do, call people, right? Email the world and ask them, has anybody seen a giant red balloon, right? Not gonna happen. This was an experiment that was run, I believe it was by the Department of Defense, and they put 10 giant red balloons all over the United States, and this was done in 2009 or 10, when a lot of these social media tools were in existence. And they grouped teams from all sorts of the top universities, MIT, you know, a bunch of others. And they said, we'll give you, I think it was 30 or 40 grand, if you're the first team that can find where these 10 red balloons are. Anybody wanna guess how long it took them to find these 10 red balloons in the United States? They, they thought it would take them around three weeks. How long do you think it took them? Nine hours. So within nine hours, they were able to find 10 randomly spread out balloons in the United States through the use of social networks and social tools and a little bit of kind of the gamification incentive component. This is what we're dealing with. This is how the world is changing. And what, what this really leads to is that your network size affects the difficulty of problems that you're able to solve, right? The larger your connected and engaged network is, the more complex and complicated the problems are that you are able to solve. If you have a large engaged network, you can solve more complex, more interesting, and more difficult problems. And a part of this gets back to this notion of the strength of weak ties, right? Now, this is what's really, really fascinating about all these social and collaborative tools that we're seeing in the enterprise. Strong ties are, you know, the, the deep, meaningful relationships that you can maintain. You can only maintain a couple of those. But a lot of these social networks within the, within the enterprise are enabling us to build these weak ties, these bridges to other groups of information, right? They're, everyone on Twitter that you are connected with is most likely uh, a weak tie. Everyone on LinkedIn is most likely a weak tie. Most of the people that you have following you on Facebook are probably a weak tie. But think about the value and how you guys, or how they benefit you and how you benefit them. They share your content, they uh, refer you opportunities. How many times have you asked one of your LinkedIn followers, hey, any, any chance you can introduce me to so-and-so? Can you help me with this? Right? Weak ties are extremely, extremely important. And this is what is new within the enterprise. Previously to having these social and collaborative tools, there was no scalable way to build these weak ties. We had no bridges within our enterprise. We had these buckets and these people spread out everywhere and there was nothing to connect them. Now, for the first time ever, we're able to connect large groups of people and data and information. So what are some of the common collaboration problems that we're seeing within the enterprise? I'm sure many of you guys can relate to this. This is probably nothing new, and I won't go through all of them. But things like finding subject matter experts, finding information, dealing with duplication of content issues, uh, making work more efficient and more productive, work-life balance issue is a huge, you know, huge one. I'm sure many of you guys have heard of uh, you know, the recent thing with Yahoo, right? Um, Work-life balance is a huge, huge issue for many companies. So what's the point, right? Why, why do any of these types of things? Now, when you get the book, you'll see that there is a more built-out version of this. I couldn't fit it all onto the PowerPoint. But basically, 
we've seen that there are five types of organizations. And again, when you get the book, you'll see the criteria. There are around 26 criteria that we use to, um, to figure out where an organization sits within this. But there are essentially five types of organizations. Unaware companies that really just have no idea about any of this stuff. Exploratory companies that are kind of testing out the waters. Defined companies that know what they're doing, right? They've defined the different things, they've defined the strategy they're gonna start implementing. You have the adoptive organizations that are actually starting to adopt and use the tools. And then you have the adaptive organizations that are looking at what's next. Now, as you progress and evolve, what happens is you start to see that your strategic value gap decreases, right? Right now, there is a big strategic value gap between organizations that are at the very bottom versus organizations that are at the very top. As you progress, your strategic value gap starts to decrease. So these are the 12 principles, and I'm gonna talk about each 12 of these, and I'm gonna give you an example for each one of these. So these are the 12 common patterns or the 12 common success factors that we've seen that make organizations successful when it comes to enterprise collaboration. The first one is individual versus corporate value. A lot of times when we speak with companies, they have a strong tendency to focus on the value to the enterprise, right? They communicate, all of you guys should do this because of the value it's gonna to bring to our company, ha 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 ha, right? And it's, it's all about the enterprise, right? It needs to be about the individual, it needs, to about, it needs to be about the employee. What do your employees get from doing this? Why should they bother? Who cares if it makes your company more money or saves money, what about the employee? Right? So conveying that individual value, not just the corporate value, is crucial. Example here is AMP Bank. AMP Bank is based in Australia. They have around 6,000 employees. Luke, Lucas, are you here? Lucas, there's Lucas. Okay, Lucas is in the back. If anybody wants to talk to Lucas afterwards, he can tell you some of what they've been doing. But Lucas and his team, they actually sat side by side with a lot of their employees to try to understand how the way they work in conveying this type of individual value. That's something that a lot of organizations don't do. Sitting side by side and helping understand how your employees work and helping them understand the value of what these tools are. Next one is strategy before technology. I know this should be common sense. I know it should, and I even feel kind of silly putting this up here. But when we did our big uh, research project in 2011, we found that a very small percentage of organizations are putting strategy ahead of technology. Just to give you an analogy of what that's like, Imagine you go into a hardware store, you buy a hammer for half a million dollars, and you just go home and just start beating the crap out of your walls. Right? That's what most companies are doing. They're taking a very, very expensive hammer and just looking at things that they can bash in. Right? That is not the right way that you wanna go about doing this. Good example of a company that is putting strategy ahead of technology is State Street Bank. They manage over $2 trillion in assets. They have around 30,000 employees. Um, I believe they started their initiative in 2008. And right when they started, they already started to prepare and plan for kind of, you know, the adoption phase. They knew that ideation and innovation was a key area that they were looking to improve on. So they built their strategy around that. And today they're looking at ways to kind of improve and scale and integrate other areas. Listening to the voice of the employee. How many of you, or let me ask you this, if you had to guess, what percentage of the United States workforce is either actively disengaged or not engaged? What would you say it is? And when I say actively disengaged or not engaged, I'm essentially saying literally defined as sleepwalking through their day-to-day -day jobs. What percentage of United States workers do you think are literally sleepwalking through their jobs? 65? 60? 71%. 71% of workers in the United States, according to Gallup, I believe it was, are essentially defined as sleepwalking through their day-to-day -day jobs. Anybody here watch The Walking Dead? Right, a bunch of people here. For those of you not familiar with The Walking Dead, just to go on a day, first of all, it's the greatest show ever. Right, for those of you that like zombies and wanna see carnage. We're living The Walking Dead, right? We, there are zombies among us in this very room 71% of workers in the United States were sleepwalking through their jobs. That is a scary, scary statistic. Listening to the voice of the employee is crucial. There used to be a big, well there still is, uh, a big management consulting company. I'm not gonna mention their name. Um, somebody laughed, I'm assuming they know who it is. 
Um, so there, there used to be this very large management consulting company. They were at all the case studies, at all the Enterprise 2.0 conferences. Everybody used to talk about them. Adoption rates are so great. You know, their executives would all be on stage and they would all be talking about it and yeah, how great we are. Um, and they were for a while. Uh, that's because they used to have two-week iteration cycles, right? They listened to the voice of the employee and every two weeks they would do new things to their product. And they would listen to their employees and they had community managers and it was this whole great thing. And then one day they decided to turn the project over just to IT. Uh, clearly some of you know where this is going. Um, once it was turned over to IT, uh, the listening to the voice of the employee virtually ceased. Right? They stopped listening to employee feedback, they stopped doing these iterations of the product, they stopped caring. They said, hey, our employee adoption rates are high, let's just kind of take it easy. This company, as far as their engagement and collaboration levels, have obliterated to virtual nothingness. You will never hear them at a conference. I, I don't even mention their name, it's like Voldemort, right? I'm, it's, it's, it's horrible. And they've, they've gone back to nothingness, right? All because they set expectations that they would listen to the voice of the employee and then they destroyed that expectation. It's very, very crucial to listen to the voice of the employee. Learn to get out of the way. If I come to you and say, wear any color you want as long as it's black, you're probably gonna hit me, right? But a lot of organizations are doing this within their enterprises. They're saying, yeah, we'd love for you to collaborate and become more open and be transparent and share, but don't do this, 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 or this, don't say that, don't do that, and don't talk to this person, and don't do any of that. Where does that leave you, right? What's the point, right? What is the point of that? There is no point. So you wanna avoid the wear any color because it's black mentality. It's not about policing and enforcing, it's about encouraging and engaging and getting people to you know, do the desired behaviors that you want them to do. Yum Brands is one of my favorite examples of this. You know, They own KFC, Taco Bell, Pizza Hut. They have around a million employees around the world. I wish I had some screenshots of some of the really cool internal marketing stuff that they did. They had more fun with their internal marketing and collaboration initiatives than any company I've ever seen. They had things where you would walk into the bathroom when you would wash your hands. They would have decals in the mirrors to make it look like you're staring at a profile of yourself with like dummy information. And it would say like, do you want people to think this about you? Go fill out your real profile, right? On all the elevators, when the doors would open and close, they would make it look like people were coming together to shake hands, right? On the inside and outside of all their elevators. Every employee got a, a little welcome, you know, a little welcome thing that looked like a, an iPhone box. So when an employee would get to their desk, they would see what looked like an iPhone box. Sadly, it wasn't an iPhone. Um, but it gave them like strategies on things that they could do and how they can engage. They gave t-shirts to everybody. They did mouse pads. They had so much fun doing this. And they get out of the way. They let employees do the things that they need to do and they don't try to enforce and police them. Next one is leading by example. If leaders aren't on board, why should your employees be? No reason. Right? If your leaders are not on board, why should your employees be? This isn't about writing a check. Right? This isn't about having a CEO record a video, send it out to everybody and say, yes, I support it, woohoo, go team, and that's it. Right? This is about people seeing that your senior level leaders and mid-level managers are using the tools and participating and engaging. You can have a CEO that's sitting in a cab that just scrolls through the newsfeed that pushes like on you know, an employee comment. Right? How powerful is it for that employee to say, oh man, out of the 50,000 people we got working here, CEO liked my comment. How long does that take the CEO? Three seconds, two seconds? Right? We're not talking about these massive, grand employee, you know, CEO needs to write 100 blog posts a week and he needs to you know, get a live cam streaming on him all the time. We're talking about simple little things that senior level leaders and executives can do to let them know they're there. Gloria, who's here, has a great quote. Um, People support what they help build. If you get the senior level leaders and the right stakeholders involved early on and help them build this, they are going to be invested in the success. Right? So you want to make sure that you have the right people involved early on. Unisys, Ed Coleman, their CEO is actually one of the people that endorsed the book. And you know, Unisys is one of the few companies where this actually came from the CEO. The CEO put together a committee. I, I mean, they literally have an executive committee that I think it's every month reports on kind of like adoption and usage levels and you know, makes sure that everybody's on track, right? Ed Coleman, as Gloria mentioned, the CEO is actively involved and he's checking these things right when he gets you know, into the office every morning. 
That is what it means to lead by example. Integrate into the flow of work. It needs to be part of how employees work. If employees are doing all their work here, and all of a sudden you're trying to send them over here, it's not gonna work, right? It needs to be a part of the same thing. TELUS is one of my favorite examples. They're a 30,000 person company. They're kind of like the Canadian Comcast. Hopefully they're not offended that I said that. Um, but they've done a tremendous job of integrating all sorts of things into one environment. I mean, it's all built on top of uh, SharePoint as their base, but they use Second Life platforms, video conferencing solutions, they use all sorts of really interesting things, and they've integrated everything together, along with a lot of other things, like their HR, their billing and invoicing, their ticketing. So you go to one place to get work done. It's the collaborative operating system for the enterprise. Right? That is where a lot of these companies are going. Creating a supportive environment. Right? What does creating a supportive environment look like? Well, it means education and training. It means casual lunch and learns. It means reverse mentoring for your executives. Having open Q&A sessions. It means you know, being creative and having fun and just you know, doing things that you think you need to do to get people involved. This doesn't need to be something that you plan a year in advance. Right? People are gonna have questions. You're, if you're a community manager or an evangelist and you wanna help people, come up with ways that you can help people. This doesn't need to be a difficult thing. Anybody here hear of The Motley Fool? Okay. Motley Fool is the only company I have ever spoken with that has a chief collaboration officer. I've spoken with hundreds of companies. Only company I've ever found that has a chief collaboration officer. They do all sorts of amazing things. Offline things as well, they play games, right? They have these interesting types of games where they put a bunch of money into a pot, right? And they have around 250, 300 employees, I think. And so they, they, you know, they put a bunch of money into a big pool. And if every employee can get every other employee's name right, on the first try, the money's unlocked to everybody. Right? They do this in person. So this is what it, and by the way, they, they got it right. And so these are the types of things that they do. They play games, they, you know, they get people to work together, they do, and then this is, all translates into an online environment that they have as well. You can move their furniture around, you can move their desks around, like people can literally just take their desk and walk somewhere else and work wherever they wanna work, right? And I'm not saying that every organization needs to do this, but this, this is what it means to have that type of a supportive environment. They educate, they train people, they remove as many boundaries and as many barriers as they can. You wanna work there, go work there. You wanna talk to that person, go talk to that person. There's no hierarchy, there's you know, none of that. So it's really, really uh, an amazing institution. Measuring what matters. When we did a research project last year in 2011, I was actually extremely shocked to find, so this is a question that we asked. We said, how many organizations are defining some sort of KPIs to really know where their collaboration initiatives are going? 60% of the companies said no KPIs whatsoever. None. None. This is the equivalent of getting in an airplane that you've never flown before, and just kind of soaring in the skies, right? Not gonna get you very far. Now, what's really interesting is that 25% of the companies said, yeah, we're measuring KPIs, so we asked them a follow-up question, and we said, great, for the 25% of companies that are measuring KPIs, how are you doing on those KPIs? Almost 50% of that group of 25% said they don't know. So, let me summarize what we have here. So 60% of companies, no KPIs. 25% of companies, yes, KPIs. But half of that, they're defining their KPIs but never following up. So in other words, day one, these are the KPIs and that's it. And nobody ever talks about it again. Right? So they're defining the KPIs but not following up on them. Huge, huge mistake. You have to measure what matters. Web Trends is here, right? So Web Trends has been doing some very interesting things as far as integrating data and analytics and enterprise collaboration. So go talk to those guys, see what they're doing. Persistence. How many of you here have kids? When you were teaching your kid how to walk, if your kid fell down, did you just look at your kid and say, eh, maybe walking's not for you? <laughs> right? Nobody does that. Nobody says, eh, you know, you fell down. Eh, maybe, uh, you know, just stay down there. Right? You say, eh, get back up, keep trying, keep moving forward. You know, it, it, it takes time. You need to be persistent. You're gonna run into obstacles. Every single company runs into obstacles. Every single company runs into challenges. Nobody gets it, you know, nobody has kind of like this smooth experience where everything was perfect. Um, it just doesn't happen. The mentality that you need to have is collaboration isn't a option, it's the option. 
you know, when I speak to executives within companies, I like to go in there and I say, pretend you didn't have email within your company to get stuff done. There's no email. Email was never invented. How are you going to do work within your company? How are you going to talk to people? Right? Get in that mentality that there are other ways of doing work. Better, more effective, more productive ways of working. Children's Hospital is my example with this one. They actually, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to mention any vendors, but they started off with a particular platform a couple years ago. They launched a pilot. It went for around a year. And they had you know, many thousands of people on it. It failed miserably. It's a miserable failure. Like horrible, horrible, miserable, worst kind of failure you can imagine. They had an option at that point. They could have said, eh, let's just kill this and never do anything again. Or they said, let's start again and see where we go. And very happy to say that uh, within the last, I think, six to nine months, they've rebuilt their efforts, gone with a different platform, and they're doing some really, really cool things. But they learned a lot from their first failure. So failure isn't a bad thing, right? There are going to be obstacles and problems that you run into at every single company. Adapt and evolve. I love this quote from Bruce Lee, who always says, be like water. And anybody that's seen the interview with Bruce Lee, he says, you know, you put water into a teapot, it becomes a teapot. You put it into a glass, it becomes the glass. And the same is true for the enterprise collaboration space. You need to adapt and evolve. The technologies are going to change, right? Many of the technologies that organizations are deploying today weren't even in existence three to five years ago, right? You look back six, seven years ago, no, Facebook didn't exist, Twitter didn't exist, Wikipedia was barely even around, right? There was no Instagram, there was no Foursquare. Things change quickly. Technologies emerge and they change very, very quickly. And new behaviors are going to surface. If I were to come to you five, ten years ago and say, you know, one day you're going to have all your personal information online for the world to see. I'm going to be able to look you up and tell you what you like, who your friends are, where you shop, where you are, who you like, who you don't like, what book you're reading, what movies you like. You look at me like I'm nuts, right? Now look at us. We can't wait to tweet about something, right? We can't wait to check in on Foursquare and tell people where we are. So these behaviors have changed, and they didn't exist a couple years ago. And it just really goes to show how things are changing. My example here is Lowe's. Lowe's is, um, you know, I think I have around 350 or 400,000 employees. Uh, Lowe's Home Improvement, for those of you not familiar. And they've been involved with their enterprise collaboration initiatives for quite some time. And Lowe's has gone to the point where they even have their own internal social business conference um, I actually spoke at one of their events, but they actually have an internal social business conference where they get their community managers together, where they get you know, different thought leaders and experts and whatnot to come in and speak and present. Um, and they do all sorts of really interesting and amazing things. They're always planning on different things they can integrate. They always have people that are looking at new technologies and figuring out ways to try to put things together. So you always need to look at how you can adapt and evolve. The next one is collaboration also benefits the customer. This is something that we don't hear about enough. But collaboration internally also has a tremendous impact on your customer. Intuit's a really good example here. Um, Intuit actually built their platform from scratch internally. Now what's really interesting about Intuit is they had an ideation innovation problem. They wanted to get more products and more ideas out to customers. So they leveraged their collaboration environment to come up with more ideas and better products and better services for their customers. We see a lot of examples where a customer might have an issue online or they'll send you a tweet or they'll send you a message or a feedback form. What happens? The rep takes that information, they bring it internally, they get the best people to find the solution and then they push that information back out to the customer. Right? Being able to tap into the collective intelligence of your team is extremely valuable and it does also benefit the customer at the end of the day. Finally, number 12, which is my favorite one, which I don't think anybody ever talks about. Collaboration makes the world a better place. I know I went to UC Santa Cruz, so you guys are probably thinking I'm a little hippie-ish, but let me explain. US companies spent over $400 billion on stress-related issues, $400 billion. And this was, I think, in 2011. One of the leading causes of stress within the United States alone is work. We always think about work. Anybody know what the number one thing is that people do when they wake up before they even get out of bed or kiss their spouse? Check, how did everybody know? Right? How awkward is that where you wake up in the morning and you're like, uh, email, right? Before you even look at your spouse and, you know, good morning, honey, how are you? Uh, now I've got to check the email, right? That's how you know we're, we have a problem. Email used to be for asynchronous communication. 
I would send you an email, you get back to me within maybe 24 to 48 hours. Now on YouTube, you can see people that are literally walking into polls because all they do is they stare at their email. Email has become a glorified instant messaging program and it's gotta stop, right? Email is not for chat, right? But we use it for chat. I'll be there in five minutes, okay. What's the point, right? What is the point of it? Why is email chat? It's not. Asynchronous communication. I have people that literally get mad at me if I don't respond to their email in like four to six hours, right? It's crazy. So what's this notion of collaboration makes the world a better place? Well, I think that within a lot of organizations, if you can make employees more engaged and more passionate about the work that they're doing, you can allow them to engage with their peers, you can allow them to have a voice within your company, you can allow them to work for more flexible work environments, I think you'll be able to reduce the amount of stress that that employee feels in their life. I think when they get home, they'll have less arguments with their spouse. I think they'll have more time to spend with their loved ones and with their family, right? So I think, you know, for the first time in the history of business, organizations have the opportunity to invest in something that not only positively impacts the lives of employees at work, but also outside of work. And it's something very, very unique that we haven't seen in the past. This is the new foreign way to work. Not having social and collaborative tools and not looking at the future of work is the foreign way to work. It used to be the standard, right? It used to be that, oh, well, these social and collaborative tools, these are all new things. Not anymore. Not having them is the foreign way to work. And what we're looking to do is go from this to this, right? How can organizations adapt to the changes in behavior and technology that we're seeing today? This is what we're looking to build, a connected and engaged workforce. Now, there's only one thing that we can ever be sure of, and that is uncertainty, right? We never know what tomorrow is gonna bring. We never know what's gonna happen with our companies, with our competitors. Knowing that the future is uncertain, how do you want your organization to move into that uncertain future? Do you want to move into that uncertain environment where everybody is separated and fragmented and people aren't communicated and engaged? Or do you want to move into that uncertain environment where you're moving together as a unit, as a company, as a whole, where your employees are sharing information and can help you figure out the problems that you're going to be faced with, right? This is a question that a lot of organizations need to answer. And unfortunately, today, most organizations are moving into this uncertain period completely fragmented and completely broken and separated. The smart companies, the progressive companies, are actually moving into this type of an uncertain environment together. Right? They're connecting and engaging their employees. They're making sure that people have the right information and everyone is moving forward as a team. So now I'll open it up to any questions. Uh, again, everybody will get a copy of the book, um, courtesy of NewsGator. They're gonna follow up after the event. And I think some books are here, so we'll give out some books at the event as well. But for those of you that don't get one today, NewsGator will be sending that one out to you. So any questions, please? About chess, too. I'm happy to take chess questions. No questions? Last chance. No questions? Yes, there we go. Brave soul, thank you. Hey, Curtis from Kellogg again. Um, so I, one of the things that you pointed out was measure what matters. Um, a lot of times I've seen people measure everything that moves. Do you have any advice for what things are worth measuring or not measuring? So the reason I didn't have an example up for that particular slide is because I find that every organization has specific, specific things that they want to look at. I mean, if you talk to Gloria from Unisys, she's probably going to have different things that she's measuring than Lucas from AMP. I will say that most organizations focus on busy metrics, which is a problem, right? Most organizations focus on um, comments, ideas, how many people did that, how many uh, of these things do we have? And it's a problem because all that you're doing in that type of a situation is you're looking at the effect of what's happening, but you really don't understand the cause of why people are doing that. So I think it depends on your organization. Some organizations are clearly able to show, you know, how many new products we've developed, um, how much service has improved, how much money we've generated, or how much money we've saved. Other organizations are simpler, and they look at, you know, adoption metrics, and they just look at things that matter to them. There used to be somebody that worked at MEC, which is a Canadian co-op, and she had an interesting quote that said, you know, I like to think that what we're doing is generating ROI, but is it really worth my time trying to figure out what that ROI is? 
Because ROI is really, you know, this dollar amount that you're looking to get at. And to figure out that ROI is going to take you a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of resources. It's up to you as an organization if it's worth your time to figure what that, you know, figure out what that's going to be. So, hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions? I have one. Um, adoption is a hot topic, correct? You've got stories. You've, you've talked about it a little bit. Could you expand uh, a little bit on, uh, on some, some, some themes, some, some strategies around adoption? Sure. Um, so we create a lot of resources on all sorts of different things for uh, our site. In fact, anytime you download a white paper or a resource from our site, one of the things that we ask you is, what is your biggest collaboration problem? By far, most people select employee adoption as their biggest collaboration problem, by far, above everything else. And yeah, I'll give you kind of an example. So one of our clients, a uh, 300,000 person company, they have a team of around you know, five to seven people that's running their collaboration initiative for the whole enterprise. Conservative company, everybody wears a suit and tie to work. They do, you know, the extent of their internal marketing is they send something out in a newsletter, right, to tell people about their enterprise collaboration initiatives. Then you look at a, another company like uh, Telstra, uh, which is a Australian company, which has a team of around 40 people which has a budget of several millions of dollars, which is doing all sorts of interesting things on internal marketing and collaboration and promotion and making sure that the team has the resources to succeed. And you try to compare those two and you look at one company, which I won't mention, um, and you say, well, why are their adoption levels so low? And then you look at a company like Telstra and say, yeah, why are they doing so well with their adoption? I mean, look at Unisys, right? Gloria said that they were 91%, but with their entire workforce, I think around 73%. Right? But you look at the things that a company like Unisys is doing or a company like Yum Brands, right? look at how they're marketing and promoting their initiatives internally. So if I had to pick a couple things, I definitely think uh, getting senior level leaders on board is huge. Right? If you don't have the top level leaders on board, you're wasting your time, you know, just plain and simple. Making sure that you have the right, right resources to support your collaboration initiatives. Education, training, whatever it is. There need to be some sort of realistic resources in there so that this can move forward. Um, those are crucial ones, making sure the technology is intuitive um, and easy to use, making sure that you get use cases from your employees and you understand how they work and why they work a certain way. I mean, those are all some of the common things that we see. Uh, again, in the book, there's, there's tons of other use cases and a framework for how to map your use cases as well, all around employee adoption, whole chapter on that. Yeah. Sorry, I know I should be giving all of you books. If you come up for me after me uh, after the session, I'll. Hi, I'm Ida Maida, J.P. Morgan. Um, you mentioned Yahoo. What's your observation on that? Um, <laughs> I know a lot of people that work at Yahoo, so I should. Um, you know, I think Yahoo is one of those organizations where I, I know people are very mixed on on what Yahoo is doing. I think essentially what Yahoo is doing is when they started this whole virtual work workforce thing. They didn't really have enough of a foundation or kind of a, a you know groundwork in place to make that successful, but they kind of went with it, and it got to a point where things just got a little out of hand and where they just kind of lost touch with everything. I think the initiative that Yahoo's doing is going to be temporary. I think what they're really trying to do is just get everybody to regroup again, kind of get everybody on the same page, set the foundation, and then they're going to you know change policies again. I. I obviously don't know the whole internal structure of what's going on at Yahoo. I know that whoever wrote the quotes for Marissa um, in the PR, and I'm going to space on those quotes, but as far as what those quotes say, whoever wrote them for Marissa, I think are absolutely ridiculous. Um, as far as saying that you know work suffers when um, you're not in the work, you know when you're not in the same physical environment. There are studies that show that once employees are farther than 160 to 200 feet apart, the chances of them communicating and collaborating drops to virtually nil, right? This is down the hall, right? So if you're down the hall from me, the chances of me coming to talk to you and work with you, virtually nil. So I think some of the statements, and again, I don't know if Marissa wrote them or you know, PR team wrote them, I think the reasoning that they publicly stated was ridiculous, but I think there's more to it. I think they just kind of want to regroup, and then I think they'll change the policy. I think it's temporary. Yes. Hi. Um, I, I just wanted to, I'll be the contentious one here and challenge a little bit. I just wanted you to expand a little bit on what you just said about um, if you don't have executive sponsorship, then you might as well just forget it. Because I think that that, if, if we did a show of hands, how many people in the room here have clear executive sponsorship? Okay, so that's not everybody. 
So should we all just quit our jobs and, and move on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll start our own thing together. Um, <laughs> no, that's a good point. I mean, there are some organizations where a lot of these initiatives tend to start at the grassroots uh, level, right? And they kind of start to bubble up. Eventually, you do need to have a senior level leader on board to help move this forward because they need to provide budget and they need to say that we stand behind this and this is a company-wide thing. It's not often that that happens right from the get-go, right? I mean, there are plenty of examples where organizations will deploy some sort of a free tool. All of a sudden, a lot of people are starting to use it. They've been using it for six months. Senior management gets wind of it. And then they say, okay, we need to do something about it. But at that point, then senior level leadership is involved. So at some point, senior level leaders do need to be involved, I think, for the long-term success of this initiative. I haven't spoken to or heard any company that is, you know, we have great adoption levels, we have tens of thousands of people using this, nobody from the senior le level leadership is involved. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, great. Sorry, Gloria. Executive leadership sponsorship and executive leadership activism actually using the tools. So if, how many can say in this room that your executive leaders are actually in your social tools every day, that they have an active presence of the people who raised their hand? That's what I thought. Good point. We have one, one more question over here, Jacob. Sorry. I just had a follow-up question on um, the notion of consumerization. Um, situation where you don't have executive leadership support, but the company is simply run over by people just taking over with social media. How do you address that? I mean, how do you? You're talking about external, like yeah, so like viral tools, you know, that could be used within the company that are being used by company by employees without the agreement of the company, and all of a sudden, executive executive leadership is simply just overwhelmed by it and has to to support it, you know, one way or the other. So I've seen a couple different approaches to this. I've seen some organizations, you know, there's a very large financial institution. I've had some conversations with some of you about this. I'm not going to yell them out, but there is a financial institution out there, a very large one that many, everybody knows, that has one of everything. They have one of every platform you could think of, right? And they're okay with it for now. There are other companies, you know, like the, the CIO of Pabst Brewing Company. Pabst Brewing Company is a much smaller company, but he mandated, right, it, that they use a particular tool, right? So he basically said, you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the, his the people that worked under him were just kind of like, eh, we don't understand, it, we don't get it, we don't really want to use it, we're using other things. And he said, no, 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 you're going to be using this. So I've seen it work a couple different ways. Um, ultimately, the organization as a whole needs to make a decision and see what kind of approach they want to go down. I know if you talk to folks over at J.P. Morgan Chase, you'll find that they are um, moving towards that direction of trying to go more towards a unified platform. But if you talk to other companies, they say, eh, employees use whatever they want, we just kind of try to cobble it together and integrate it. I've seen both approaches kind of work. I think eventually you're going to get to a point where you're going to have to move and you're going to have to consolidate. You're just going to have to, right? Because data doesn't easily move from one platform to another. Collaboration standards don't exist, right? It's not like a CRM system where you can import things, you know, from one to the other. Um, but that's where the, org and, and it's a good incentive for organizations, for senior level leaders to kind of get behind it and say, okay, we will mandate something and we will do something because we see there's a lot of interest in it. So it helps management kind of wake up and say, we need to do something to support what these employees are asking for. So, I mean, does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. And you had a question too? I got nothing but time. Jacob Morgan, um, thank you very much for your talk today. Thank you.